And then um, I'm going to get started, although I forgot it. I'm going to do the same way we did last week. Um, with a recap and any questions and answers. Okay, so I'm just going to jump in. Uh, I think today's examples are going to go fairly quick. So um, hopefully we'll get some good questions in here before we get started. And then we'll look at the latest expectation, which is so popular, it has its own name. Okay, so we've been looking at expectations. So that is this operation that we've named capital E. And you take expectations of functions, which I think is the craziest part about this. So this is an operation on functions with respect to density functions. So we got like two functions floating around here. And I don't know if you guys want to think um, in terms of integrals or sums, but uh, expectation generalizes them. So we have these arbitrary functions, g, times density functions. And so far, the ones we've been looking at have been specific functions g so that we can define probability on sets. So if we are interested in the probability of some set A, that's technically an expectation with respect to an indicator function. So the indicator function is just going to return 1 if the argument x is in the set A and 0 otherwise. And we multiply that by our density function. And so this essentially gives us, you know, if we had some like discrete density function, that looked like this, defined over the points 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And if A consisted of the points 2 and 3, then essentially all this would be doing is calculating the area under the density function. If A consisted of the points 2 and 3, then 1 that then the indicator function here would be one only when X is in the set two or three. And at all other values of X, one, four, and five, the indicator function would be zero. So zero times the density function would just be zero and it would contribute nothing to this sum. But in the case that X is in the set two or three, then the indicator function is one, and one times the density function is just the density function. So you're just adding up the density function at the points two and three. Now this has been with sums, so this is all relative to, can you all give me the name of the type of distribution when the expectation turns into a sum instead of an integral. Thanks, Jake. Showed up in the chat. This has all been for discrete distributions. When the expectation turns into a sum, that happens only for discrete distributions, which are distributions defined over countable sets. Okay, so I'm gonna pause here. 
because this one slide kind of wraps up mm, maybe like three weeks of the semester that we've looked at so far, maybe four, maybe five. This one slide wraps up a bunch. So it's a recap, but it's a lot of information really quick. So which part of this does not make sense to anybody? There's various expectations in the world because different expectations depend on the argument, just like functions depend on the argument. If you're looking at a function x squared, x squared of two is different than x squared of four. So if you take a specific function, then you get like a whole different expectation out. And when the specific function g is the indicator function, that gives you probabilities. OK, how about I try this same short recap, but we do it for continuous distributions. Let's try. And hopefully, we'll get a question out of somebody at that point. So let's do a recap and questions and answers for continuous distributions. So we've been looking at expectations. It's kind of this general operation that we have named capital E. And it's an operation that takes an argument, which is a function. So expectations are an operation on functions with respect to some density function. So in the case of continuous distributions, we have an integral of this arbitrary function, g, times our density function. And this function, g, basically gives us different types of expectations. One type of expectation is called probability. And it exists when this function g is equal to the indicator function, a function that only returns 1 when the argument is contained in the set A and 0 otherwise. So if we're interested in probability, which for mathematical statistics is just, give me a second, Hayes, and I'll answer your question. If you're interested in a probability statement over some set, well, probability is just area under a density function. And our generalization for area under a function is the operation expectation. So in this case, you'd have the integral with respect to the set S of the indicator function times the density function. And there's a question in the chat that shouldn't I have X in S down here in the notation? And the answer is no, but that's only by like practice. Um, it makes more sense to have x in s down there. But in terms of integrals, the notation is the set goes on the integral, and the variable we're going to integrate over goes in this dx part. Just by custom, there's no great rhyme or reason to it. The notation for integrals over sets is the set you're going to integrate over attaches to the integral itself. And the variable you're going to integrate with respect to 
goes here on this dx part. I hope that's OK. The answer is not really, but there's no great reason why that's the case. So if we had some continuous distribution, where- Can I interrupt you? Oh yeah, totally. Uh, LaTeX language for that integral. Oh yeah, okay. Okay, Connor, so that goes backslash int underscore, and then I put um, the S in curly braces. That's not necessary. You could have just underscore A. Okay. But sometimes um, we will use more than just S here. So I'm just reminding us in this one notation, there's two ways to do the underscores. If you have more than one symbol, in the underscore, you need the curly braces. And if you only have one symbol in the subscript, you can just go underscore that symbol, like I did in this case. So that's the same for an exponent? Correct, yeah. Cool. Great, thank you. So if we had this set A, which is just an interval from A to B, oh, whoops. then this probability calculation, which is really an expectation with a specific function G with respect to some density function is just the area under that density function because that's all probability is. Probability is just area under a density function. Now the same trick happens. The indicator function is zero anytime x is not in A. And so zero is gonna, contrib is gonna multiply by the density function. Density function times zero is zero, and that will contribute nothing to this integral. And when x is in A, then the indicator function is just gonna be one, one times the density function is the density function. And so you're just taking the integral under this function from A to B. So if you're keeping up with this recap so far, this is pretty much a summary of everything we've done in the course. There's been a little bit more in like notation. We have to define the words continuous and discrete with respect to the size of sets. That is for, um, for continuous matches with uncountable sets and discrete goes to countable sets. But otherwise, these recaps are pretty much the entirety of the course thus far. We have learned that probability is area under functions. Okay, I'm gonna give us a minute to ask a question and then we're gonna start into a new expectation. That is all we're gonna do is change this function G and we're gonna look at the implications. We're doing okay with this, or are we too intimidated to ask questions? Can we get some signs of where we're at? Type it in the chat or just pop in and say, yep, sounds good, or no, this is all awful. Got one, thank you. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you.
We're up to five of 32, six of 32. <laughs> We're getting there. Oh, I guess I'm two of those. That's six of 30. Okay, I'll, well, I can't take up everybody's time if you're unwilling to ask questions. So you gotta show up in office hours or on Piazza or Discord if you got follow-up questions. Okay, so just like probability is a special case of an expectation, we're gonna look at like a new expectation. This expectation is named mean. You've probably heard the word mean before, but I doubt you've ever seen it discussed like this. And I'm gonna try throughout the week and the week following spring break to connect this idea of expectation to what you already think, what I imagine you think you know about means already. That is add up all the numbers and divide by however many there are. So in this case, let g of x equal x. Another way to write this is naming the function g just like we named the function, uh, the indicator function for probability. So in this case, we could name this function ID, which in my mind stands for identity. Why am I calling this the identity function? Because it just returns its argument. It's a function that returns whatever number you give it. If you give this function five, it returns five. If you give this function seven, it returns seven. If you give this function 3.14, it returns 3.14. So the mean is the expectation of the identity function. In the case you're working with a discrete distribution, you just go through the same idea as before. You just type in the identity function times the density function. If you have a continuous distribution, well, then it's just an integral, but the stuff inside is exactly the same. Okay, so I hope you can see all we're doing is picking a new function for g. We are slowly starting to build meaning out of expectations by specific examples. But I imagine what you all want to see at this point is how does this come into play? And that's exactly what we're going to do next if nobody's got a question. Okay, here's our first example. Let's pick the discrete uniform distribution with numbers. Okay, so you all pick some numbers. So this is a discrete uniform. This is like a dice has A equal to one and B equal to six. But if I picked A equals to one and B equals to six, you all would be like, you're gonna pick die all the time? Let's be more exciting. So why don't you all pick the numbers A and B? The only requirement is A has gotta be less than B. Two and eight. Two and eight. Somebody else, do you remember the density function? I've started you off.
Nice. We've got eight minus two plus one. So that equals Somebody, somebody not Jake and not whoever picked two and eight. Thank you. So here is a graphical representation of the density function of a discrete uniform distribution. So if we are going to calculate the mean, we'd essentially just type out the definition and then fill in the different functions. Let's fill in one function at a time, just not to get overwhelmed. There's me filling in the density function. Well, the same way I just filled in the density function, the left-hand side, and I plugged in the right-hand side, we can plug in the right-hand side of the identity function. But it's less magical than you want it to be. OK, so somebody help me evaluate this. Does this 1 7th have anything to do with x, or can it come outside the sum? It can come outside the sum. Nice. So here, we're just going to add up x from the values 2 to 8. Somebody want to do this in their head, or do they want to see how to do it in R? In R, in R, yay. Oh, look, here's all my leftover notes from your guys's, uh, from the videos for this coming week. Okay, so remember the syntax, two to eight will give us a bunch of integers from two to eight. Those are in fact, the integers we're trying to add up. So all you have to do is just call sum on it. Pretty sweet, huh? R wants to be your friend. You just have to figure out how to let it be your friend. Oh, who picked two to eight? I did, Connor. Connor, well done. You picked an example that gives us a nice number. Five is a nice number in this example, because if you think of the mean as like a the point that balances out the density function, if you think of a mean as the point that balances out the density function, so it's like you have this flat density function and it could wobble either way. Well, if you align the mean appropriately, then the function will be flat. It won't tip. So you should think of the mean as the point along the x-axis that balances out the function. And since our function is flat, the point that's going to balance it out is right in the middle. And that's exactly what 5 is. 5 is the number right in the middle. I encourage you all to try this example with a fair die. The lesson should be the mean does not need to be a number contained in the support.
I encourage you all to pick a different A and B and try this example out. You should find that you're not as lucky as Connor and there are examples where the mean is not a number in the support. Okay, let's try another example. Discrete uniform with letters instead of numbers. So that's like if we don't pick values, for A and B, we just let them be the letters A and B. I'll let you draw yourself the picture. Let's short the identity, let's short the expectation. So essentially, I'm just plugging in the identity function already. I'll plug in the density function next. Are we okay with this so far? Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Looks good. I appreciate it. Does this fraction have anything to do with X? No, so you can take it and put it in front of it. Thank you all. Uh-oh, R cannot help you out anymore. R will take sums, but only of specific numbers. You can't get R to take sums of letters because it doesn't know what those letters are. So we've got to be smarter than R here. We can do this. Think back to Calc 2. Do you know how to take the sum of a bunch of numbers where each number is an integer? I bet you have seen this before. Whoops, not equals. Does seeing the sum written out like this jog anybody's memory? There's like a formula for this. What is that formula? It is a series. It's a finite series. So we got a good name going. But what is this equal to? <laughs> no, don't cry. This is an easy one. I'm only dragging us through the easy ones. Okay, uh, how about this? Oh, Christian, you have the right answer. And because you got it, I will put the hint down in the notes. But I was already writing out fill in the blank as a challenge problem. Complete this problem as a challenge problem. So we're going to compromise. I will add the note, the hint to the notes because Christian typed it out. Thank you, Christian. But I was already typing out complete this problem, fill in the blank as a challenge problem. 
So I'm going to leave it to you all to do so. I will give you the answer. You've got to fill in the blank. This is the answer. A plus B over two. This makes perfect sense. This is exactly what we did for uh, the last example where we looked at the discrete uniform with A equals to two and B equals to eight. Notice all we did was took two plus eight, 10, and divided it by two, five. The mean is the point that balances out the function. Well, if your function is flat, then all you got to do is find the middle of it. And the middle of it is just add up the endpoints and divide by two. So if you want to think about what I was saying earlier when I said the mean does not have to be a number in the support, then use this formula, a plus b over 2, for the case of a fair die. For a fair die, what is A? One. And what is B? Six. What is one plus six? Seven. Divided by two? Three and a half. Was that a big, oh, I just turned. That was so shocking, I just turned off my headphones. Can you all hear me? Yeah. OK, at least you all are getting the point that 3.5 is not on the die. That's the takeaway. 3.5 is not on. 3.5 is not in the support of a fair die. It is not any of the numbers, one, two, three, four, five, or six. And yet it is the point that balances out the density function for a fair die. That's crazy. I know it, that's just crazy. All right, so I'm gonna leave this one as a challenge problem to you all. I had planned a practice problem for you all. Here's my practice problem for you all. This one is easier once you get started. The continuous uniform distribution doesn't deal with sums, but instead deals with an integral. An integral. And once you have the integral in front of you, the integral is actually not that difficult because the density function for a continuous uniform doesn't have any x's in it. So the integral is fairly easy. So I'm going to leave this one as a practice problem for you all. And I gave you the answer again. The answer turns out to be the same thing for a discrete uniform as it does for a continuous uniform. OK. Here's another example. Let's try to find the mean of the Bernoulli distribution with p equals to 1 half. 
the density function is 0 0.5 to the x, 1 minus 0 0.5 to the 1 minus x. This one looks intimidating, but if you recall that the sample space is just 0, 1, it turns out to be fairly easy. So the expectation of the identity function just turns out to be x times 0 0.5 to the x. Uh, do you all see that this is still just 0 0.5? All I did was plugged in the density function and one minus one half is still one half. I hope so. So check this out. X can only be two numbers, zero or one. So we've got zero times the density function. Does it actually matter what the density function here is? No, because it'll just still be zero. Good. Now that you see that, I will write it out. But as long as you, whoops, I can't draw my x as an exponents today. This is 0 times a bunch of stuff. So this term is 0. Plus, there's only one other term in the sum where x can take on the value 1. 0 0.5 to the 1. 0 0.5 to the 1 minus 1. And you know what I should do to help you out? I should fill in 0 for this x. So you see why this is zero here. So it's zero times 0 0.5 to the zero times 0 0.5 to the one minus zero plus one times 0 0.5 to the one times 0 0.5 to the one minus one. So this is zero plus, now what does this term equal? What is 0.5 to the power of one? Thank you, Renee. And what is 0.5 to the power of zero? Just one. Solid. So we've got one times 0.5 times one is 0 0.5. So the answer is 0 0.5. But look at what that's doing. This is a Bernoulli distribution. There's only two values that the density function takes on, zero and one. And it takes on each of those with probability 1 half, because that's what we chose p to be. But the answer is 0 0.5. The answer is not 0 or 1. The point that balances this function is 0 0.5. There's this function with only two points on it. We got to ask, where does it balance out? We want to move along the x-axis to figure out where we can balance this function out. But because the function only has these two points and they're of the same height, the point at which the function is balanced, the mean, is 0 0.5. OK, let's try one more. One more, and then we should have time for some questions and a final challenge problem. I was mean this week. I gave you guys a lot of challenge problems. In general, you can write out the Bernoulli density function like this. We just happen to fill in p equals to 0.5 for the last example. So if we're going to find the mean, we need a sum of x times p to the x, 1 minus p to the 1 minus x for x in 0 and 1. All right, you all tell me what's the first term in the sum. And please spell it out. Don't just tell me it's equal to 0. What is the first sum? Uh, what is the first term in this sum? What's the first value x can take on? 
zero. And what do we multiply it by? P to the zero. Solid. P to the zero times? One minus P to the one. Nice, because one minus zero is just one. OK, how about the next term? Two other people. That was Jake and somebody whose name I missed because I closed my Connor. Windows. Thanks, Connor. Connor, I somehow cannot figure out it's you every time you answer. Thank you. What is the next term in the sum? One times P to the one. One times P to the one times? One minus P to the zero. Minus P to the zero. Perfect. Thank you, Renee and Joseph, for getting answers in the chat as well. OK, also, zero times the density function. Zero times whatever is? Pretty sure it's zero. OK, good. <laughs> Me too. Good call. One times p to the 1 is just p. 1 minus p to the 0 is 0. So this is just 0 plus p is equal to p. So again, if you look at this <clears throat> in terms of a density function, this is just a Bernoulli distribution. It can only take on two values, 0 or 1. It's a little bit hard to draw where p is on this. So we'll just say p is some big number way up high here. And so this is 1 minus p down here. Now the point along the x-axis that balances out this function actually happens to be over here, equal to p. Why is it? that the point that balances out this function is closer to 1 if p was bigger than 1 minus p. According to the way I drew it, which of these two points has more weight? Which of these two points has more weight? More weight is by taller. More weight is by taller. So in this case, one has more weight than does zero. The way I drew it, one has more weight than does zero. The way you can think about that is if your function is like this, and this side weighs a whole bunch, you got to move closer out to this side to balance out this function. You've got to move closer to one to balance out this function. Because one, according to my picture, has more weight. OK, but notice, you can switch this whole picture up. OK, I'm going to draw essentially the same picture. But what you got to notice here is p is now smaller. So the answer is still p, but p is now smaller. So we are essentially closer to the value that has more weight. Because p is smaller than 1 minus p, the value 0 has more weight. When the value 0 has more weight, that means 1 minus p is bigger, and that means p is smaller. So in order to balance out this function, you only have to move out to a small value p. You're closer to the value that has more weight.
we're going to look at more examples of this expectation this week. The entire week is devoted to this specific expectation and one other slightly more complicated one, but we're going to spend a lot more time with the second one in future weeks. The focus of this week is going to be this one. So I'm going to leave you all with a challenge problem. Apparently it's the second because we couldn't answer that question about the series earlier. Or we could, but it took us a little bit too long for my taste. I haven't told you all about the exponential distribution. So I'll draw it for us and I'll give us the density function. The density function depends on this extra value. It happens to have the name lambda. And it's a continuous distribution. So the sample space is zero to infinity, positive infinity. And the distribution essentially looks like this. And so the challenge is find the mean. And again, I will give you the answer. And because this one is a little bit more challenging, my hint is integration by parts. But I'm not trying to make Jake cry again. OK, all, we got two minutes left. <laughs> Jake absolutely refuses to do integration by parts. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Not even considering this problem. Uh, I encourage you to do integration by parts uh, because the answer here is, well, I guess it's just a calculus practice problem in the end. I'll try to draw this plot for us later on, uh, maybe after spring break. <laughs> I think we means fun. I'm going to take as we as fun. <laughs> um, if y'all have any questions, I'll hang out for maybe the next five minutes. I'm happy to answer some in the last minute of this class. Um, this week is going to focus on problems like this and hopefully some more intuition surrounding the mean though we do get into some R a little bit. And then after spring break, I'm going to really focus on the data side to try to connect um, the mean to things you might already know, like add up the data and divide by however many there are. So I'm going to stop recording now, but I'll hang out for maybe five more minutes.